A Terrible Thing Has Happened by Natasha Graham. There were two things that Mrs. L. M. Everland wasn't. She wasn't married, never had been, and she wasn't a good cook. It's rabbit, she said, putting the chipped white plate down in front of Tabitha. Or it was, she added, turning away, wiping her hands on the old red dishcloth she so often had over one shoulder. I expect you're used to much finer things in London, she said, with that glimmer of amusement in her eye as she set the tea kettle on the stove to heat up for the fourth time that evening. And Tabitha sliced a not quite boiled potato from a tin in half with her fork, foregoing the blackened cubes of rabbit for now. Not much, Tabitha answered after swallowing. Mrs. Everland sat down on the chair on the opposite side of the table, with the kettle slowly boiling behind her. She moved the jam jar of Alstromeria from the centre of the table to one side so that they could see each other better, revealing the scorch mark in the middle of the table and the old wax pot marks and the old scrubbed pine table where the candle had been in the winter. Someone give you those, Tabitha asked watching how the few wilting yellowed leaves among the green quivered slightly in the gentle breeze that came through the half-open window. Mrs. Everland smiled one of her secret smiles, gave the tiniest purse of her lips and reached out to touch one of the yellow leaves that fell neatly into her palm as if she had willed it. No, she said. I gave them to myself. She smiled again, held the tip of the leaf between her thumb and forefinger, twirling it so that the light caught the yellow and blotched brown, turning it gold and bronze in the sunlight that stretched halfway across the table between them. Like Mrs. Dalloway. She paused again. Only I picked them myself instead of buying them. Who's Mrs. Dalloway? Tabitha asked. And Mrs. Everland drew in a very long, very slow breath and then released it just as slowly. Peaceful, calm, always. As if she half existed in a dream, but only inside the house. Once outside the house, she came alive only in the minds of the outsiders that mistook her for cruel and unkind. Different. She's a character, she said, in a book. And then leaning forward slightly across the table on her forearms, with both hands clasped around the leaf, she said, a very wonderful book written by a very wonderful woman with her eyes glittering, dark and wide and full of secrets yet never to be told. She stood up slowly, Early spring, in the dark auburn brown of unruly hair, pinned with often falling hairpins on the very top of her head, so that it fell about her face in curls she never seemed to brush. Early spring light that cast a fleeting warmth across her cheek, her lips, her chin, as she passed to the shelf in the kitchen, a board she put up herself with mismatching black iron brackets. The emerald rings she always wore, three of them on every other finger of the right hand, glinting as she carefully eased a book from between another and a big clear glass jar of golden shining honeycomb. She set the book down on the table in front of Tabitha next to her plate, a well-thumbed paperback with Mrs. Dalloway in painted black writing inside a yellow border. She sat down again reached across the table and slipped the leaf between the cover and the first page. Bookmark, she said, then rested back in her chair, head to one side, regarding Tabitha with the far away and yet all-seeing look that only women are ever capable of having, and women like Mrs. Everland even more so. Do you miss them? she asked. Your parents? 
as if the question needed clarification. And Tabitha pushed the half moon of the mealy white potato over with her fork while the tea kettle began its whistle, louder and louder and louder, until the silence came. And Mrs. Evelyn had taken it from the stove and was pouring more tea into the big brown teapot. Here, she set the little blue and turquoise glazed sugar bowl down in front of Tabitha. Use the last of it as much as you want. There's always the honey. That was what Mrs. L. M. Everland was. Kind. The next morning, early, while the sparrows were still singing in the hedgerows and the spring sunshine was turning the shimmer of a light frost to the warmth of new green grass on the fields, Tabitha walked to school with three other children evacuated to Rodmel Lewis, a village somewhere amidst the South Downs. Tabitha, Nancy, Letty and Constance, all four of them 11 years old, all four from the anonymity of London's shroud of grey and white, and the murmur of pigeons in the eaves and alcoves of looming grey brick buildings turned to rubble and the dull brown rats on the wet grey cobbles. I've heard things about Mrs Everland, Nancy said, squinting into the sky, shielding her eyes while she watched the planes fly in the distance. What sort of things, Tabitha asked, watching the dewshine toes of her black boots as she walked. I've heard she never leaves her house, Letty said before Nancy had a chance to answer, turning, grinning, brown leather satchel bumping against her thigh. Well, I've heard that she killed her husband, poisoned him. Nancy, who was tall for her age with two long plaits of chestnut hair, said this with a pointed look in Tabitha's direction. Apparently, she went on, she cooked this huge, sumptuous feast for him, everything he liked, dessert too, and he ate it, but he didn't know she put poison in it first. Don't listen to her, Constance whispered, leaning her head of tight blonde curls close to Tabitha's own and interlinking her arm with hers. Nancy glanced back again and grinned a toothy grin. Then what happened? Letty asked kicking a small white round stone that looked like one of Mrs. Everland's boiled potatoes into the grass from the track. Then, Nancy drew in a breath, thoroughly enjoying her role as revealer of truths, his blood turned to ice, just froze up in his body and he died in his chair, just sitting there before he'd even eaten the stewed pears. They say he was buried still holding his spoon because his body was so seized up they couldn't get it out of his hand. Letty screwed up her face, opened her mouth to say something and then closed it again. That's not true, Tabitha said, nonchalant looking up now, edging on defiant should the weather have called for it. And how would you know? Nancy asked, all but rolling her eyes. She told me, she said. When we first arrived, she said, they'll tell you about me, the people in the village. They'll tell you I was po I poisoned my husband, but I can tell you that's not true, she quoted. Of course she'd tell you it wasn't true, Nancy laughed. She's not going to admit it, is she? She's never been married, Tabitha added, and Nancy's smile faltered slightly. And... Now is the time for the nail in the proverbial coffin. She can't cook. Nancy ignored her, chose instead to look up again at the second arrow of war planes heading north. Engines burning up in the sky and the silent. Engines burning up in the sky in the silence and leaving a ring in the air that seemed always to be there, but never lasted longer than it took to see them disappear. Well, I heard she never got married because she was having an affair, Letty began once they started walking again. This was her moment now and she paused for effect. With a woman. Oh, Nancy asked before she could stop herself. Now it was Letty's turn to look smug. A writer. She writes books, novels. She's quite famous, Letty said with an air of authority. 
Although mother said they're not appropriate, she writes stories about women who aren't women at all. They act like men. One of them, Orlando, kept turning from a man to a woman and did all sorts. Nancy's face twisted from alarm through intrigue to suspicion. What do you know? she asked, and Tabitha felt the heaviness of Constance's arm through her own and the weight of Mrs Dalloway in her satchel, as she remembered the flush of Mrs Everland's cheeks as she'd set the book down so carefully beside her. A very wonderful woman. Around the corner they bumped into Arik, an elderly man with a dog they'd passed every morning since last Tuesday on their first day to school. He tipped his cap to them, stepped aside so that his earth-brown boots crunched the final frost beneath the hedges and tugged the fraying string rope gently to bring the little black and white terrier dog to his heels. Morning, he said as he tipped his hat, the thinning blue-white skin beneath his eyes damp from the cold and his cheeks and nose of colourless grey-pink as they smiled their replies. There's some at a foot up there. He raised his free arm that held a long hand whittled cane and pointed stiffly with the end of it in the direction they were heading. Summit's going on. He spoke slowly and with an accent from further north. What? Nancy asked, all of them looking in the direction he pointed to, the place furthest from the rising sun where the field still glittered and shimmered with frost. I don't know. He lowered his stick. Men about, pleased by looks of things, poking about in them woods with sticks and dogs. Mitzi was scared witless. He tugged on the string so that the little dog with shivering legs looked up at him with blinking dark eyes and twitching black nose. Were you? He asked her and she sat down in response. I'd take the wrong, long way around if I were you down by the river pointed again with his stick in a more westerly direction where the fields hit the pathway that nobody but the locals expected down to where the river Ouse abruptly sliced the landscape small snake-like and startlingly silver. Thank you. Nancy gave their thanks as her own quiet unusually so for her still looking in the direction of the woods that seemed all but a mist and smudge of grey on the horizon. Thank you, she said again, suddenly realising her manners, turning, smiling and realising he'd already be already begun his shuffling stoop back on his way. Which way? Letty asked, narrowing her eyes like Nancy had, looking to the trees, seeing only what was perhaps her imagination moving between the trees. The river, Tabitha said, I know the way. Mrs. Everland showed me the other day when we were foraging. Nancy looked at her in the sceptical way she had inherited from her schoolmistress mother. Foraging for what? She asked, not yet quite convinced of Mrs. Everland's innocence. Mushrooms, Tabitha said, already setting off. Constance's hand still neatly tucked into the crook of her elbow. And wild garlic, she added, when Nancy and Letty began begrudgingly to follow. I thought she couldn't cook, Nancy asked as they turned down the lane in between the fields, the grass and the odd uncut blade of uncut wheat that brushed the backs of their knees. She can't, Tabitha and Constance stepped over a rabbit hole in unison. But she does try. She glanced briefly back at Nancy's screwed up face, her feet wet inside her shoes from the grass, Letty trailing along behind her. And the garlic was for a remedy she made. It has antibacterial properties. She glanced again at Nancy, enjoying fleetingly the knowledge that when it came to Mrs. Everland, she was the expert as much as one could be after knowing her only for a week. Sounds like witchcraft to me. Betty said from the back, breathless and pale, unused to walking from longer than the time it would take to step from a London doorway to a carriage. But neither girl replied. They merely stopped in a line, stopped without thinking. The grass in its dew-lit glory melted away to sand-coloured grit, shot through with the glint of splinters of quartz and feldspar. 
and the water flat, calm, both grey and silver, gold and white, sparkling beneath clouds that reflected the day in the cool of the water that ran, seemingly unmoving beneath the old stone bridge they would cross on their way to school. What's that? Letty asked after a moment of silence where the air that smelled of fresh cut grass and the early morning smell of the earth warming held them, suspended within that moment. What? Constant asked quietly, not wanting to break the stillness. Letty moved further down the slope toward the river. That, she pointed to what? looked like the ebb and flow of fabric, the same colour as both the water and the sky. In silence, they followed Letty, Nancy just behind her, the soft bump bump of four school satchels and the scuff of shoes on dry gravel and grit, the gentle lap of the water and the cheerful twittering of the birds, the only sounds in this rodmel morning. What is that? Nancy asked, and Letty stopped, now only feet from the puckering fabric, blooming and fading and blooming again, from where the old tree branches and sticks had dammed up in a corner beneath the bridge. Then slowly, ever so slowly, the colourless white of a hand, a knuckle, the glance of a gold wedding band on a finger swollen and waterlogged, and the thin, long ripples that caught, not the fragile spindles of newly snapped twigs from the trees, but the grey-brown of hair that pulled and shimmered, and from somewhere in the near distance, from above, on the outskirts of the forest, a man's voice called, Virginia! In a voice that had called for too long. That evening, in silence, Tabitha and Mrs. Everland picked Alstromeria in the garden, the flowers of friendship, love, strength and devotion, of silent mutual support and the ability to help each other through the trials and tribulations of life. They picked one of each colour and she set them in the window in an old enamel jug in the dying light of the day for Orlando, for Mrs. Dalloway, for Virginia Woolf.